What's up, everyone? Welcome to episode 75 of the Sarah's Podcast. How are you coping in these fast-changing times? Can't believe that November's around the corner, and if we peek a little further than that, this Christmas, the weather has been so naff lately, but this year's just gone so fast. I'm sure you all agree with that. This week, we had some welcome news from Chancellor Rishi Sunak, some fantastic changes to the job support scheme, self-employment grants, and even more business grants. This support is very much needed, especially to the hospitality industry. Kate Nichols, CEO of UK Hospitality, says on the matter, quote, this is a generous package of support, which will make a huge difference in safeguarding hospitality jobs. It is great that the Chancellor has listened to our concerns and those of the hospitality businesses. We have been hammered harder than any other sector, and this enhanced support will be crucial in making sure businesses stay afloat and keep jobs secure, end quote wholeheartedly agree with that as much as this is amazing help i genuinely think that it would be great to see the government back down on the 10 p.m curfew for hospitality this could really help out struggling restaurants across the uk but enable them to keep more employees on also in my view it's a bit of a no-brainer if they take more money then they pay more tax and vat and we know that restaurants have been doing it safely last week i told you that we launched a new product on the Serres online store I wanted to give you a little bit more information on the product. So for a while, we've been manufacturing seasoned rice flours for clients. And for some time, we've been sending it to other clients who have heard about it and so on. So last week, we made it available as an online stock product. It's a Ceres product, so it's always available. So everyone can now purchase it. The benefits of using a seasoned rice flour is that we use a heat-treated specialist flour for this. This reduces the chance of uncooked starch and it all going gluey. And with the added seasoning, it means that not only is the fish going to be mega tasty because it's been seasoned from the inside, that also helps reduce blow off on the batter. It, it just makes your oil last longer. There's so many more benefits in having it underneath the batter. But it also reduces the starch level, which then also helps reduce the glupiness that little bit more. Seriously, if you do use a pre-dust, you need to get on this. And if you don't use a pre-dust, well, again, just get on this. So with October coming to an end, so does this month's online shop offer. This month's offer, you probably already know this by now, but this month's online shop offer is 15% off mushy pea seasoning. To get yours, set up an account on our website. Choose the mushy pea seasoning and use the code HelloOctober15 for 15% off. It's probably worth you being on our mailing list actually we don't spam the hell out of you it's one email a month it's just a roundup of the news and a discount coupon so remember use the code hello october 15 when you make the purchase if you haven't heard of our mushy pea seasoning then you definitely need to order it it will supercharge your mushy peas it takes them to a next level the november email update will also have a coupon code included we hope to give a new coupon every month or so. And we're sort of working on a little competition. You know, we, we need a bit of fun in these weird times. So if you do have an idea for a bit of a competition, drop me a message. I recently uploaded an article to our website about maintaining cash flow. Even if you don't really know the terminology, it's explained in, in the article. We all know that it's really important to have a cash reserve in the business. There are so many outgoing costs when running any hospitality business. And this article, we look at managing your menu and inventory, looking at flexible working hours to help with wages, keeping on top of VAT. There's just so many tips. And, you know, we've been suggesting these tips to customers for years and they do make a huge difference. On to today's guest. Today's guest is Sean DeVry, the founder of Open Pantry Consultancy. Sean has been an industry leader in Melbourne's hospitality industry for over 20 years. Sean has been a venue owner himself. He knows the commitment, the effort, the experience required to develop a concept into an award-winning and profitable venture. He also knows how to develop a process to get you there that's enjoyable and rewarding for everyone involved. Today, Sean also hosts the Open Pantry Co. podcast, an initiative set up in 2018 to give hospitality leaders a voice on an international platform. The insights shared by Sean's network of hospitality pros has helped thousands of people in the industry. I really enjoyed talking to Sean. He really knows his stuff. And when it comes to hospitality, 
it's just nice to talk to people. And because it's in Australia and we're in the UK, we just wanted to talk about the differences, but also the similarities. This is pretty much a lighthearted conversation between two people at the opposite ends of the planet. We don't take ourselves too seriously. I guess that we can save the serious stuff when we interview our guests. We might actually need your help, actually. Is there a difference between tomato sauce and tomato ketchup? It comes up in this episode. I just have tomato ketchup. I don't know the difference. But apparently in Australia, there's tomato sauce and there's tomato ketchup. So you listen and let us know. Follow Sean by searching Open Pantry Consulting on Facebook, Instagram, and search for Open Pantry Co. on Twitter. And don't forget, whilst you're there, search for Open Pantry Podcasts on your favourite podcast player. On to the podcast, everyone. Hope you enjoy. Sean, nice to talk to you again, my man. Still, it's good to be back. First time listening for everyone, but second time listening for us. So I think, I think as I've um, re-recorded three or four of my podcasts before due to technical issues, the second one's always better. So I'm. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. So I mean, the chat we had the other day, you know, which is now a private conversation, was um, was really good. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> I'm looking forward to this even more <laughs> because, as I said at the start of last time's podcast, you are fish and chip royalty and in the UK. And I think Australians, like, obviously have an understanding of fish and chips. And I actually had fish and chips last night. And trust me, I was disappointed. <laughs> I won't what say, you know, I won't say what. Well, hey? Is it Barramundi? No, I think it was, no, I think it was Flake. I think it was okay, fun. and um, but the uh, like everything about it was like not exciting at all. I was really disappointed. I hadn't had this brand for a long time, and um, it was not good. And I thought of you, and I'm like, <laughs> that would be really pissed off. I, I think disappointing fish and chips just really gets on my nerves. Like, yeah, because um, it's so simple to get right, yet so easy to get wrong. Yeah, you know, just to tackle the one thing, so I don't want people thinking I am royalty. <laughs> <laughs> I can assure you that I take so much stick. Someone people that listen to me to Downing Street, like let's be honest. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, people that know me, like, you know, it's it's usually a hate hate relationship, to be honest. So, <laughs> <laughs> so no, no, so I think ultimately I think yeah, bad fish and chips just really does my head in because over in the UK you can get bad fish and chips, there's no doubt. Mm. But I know you can also get great fish and chips in a little pub and a great fish and chip shop. Everyone has the ability to make great fish and chips if you follow the basics, you yeah. know. And one mistake a lot of people do is they get a bit fancy well before getting the basics right. And right. I understand it because everyone wants to flash things up a little bit, you know. How and do, uh how do you how do you like how do you see that people flash up fish and chips? Is it like a batter? Is it like a different kind of fish? Is um, it are they doing some weird things over there? Like you could, if you wanted to, change the species of the fish. That's cool. Like okay. that's not flashing it up. Certain fish I would never do. Like although I have, and that's why I now would never do them. You know. <laughs> so for example, battered salmon. Seriously. Right. It's probably the most vilest thing ever. Um, because when you batter salmon, I'd breadcrumb salmon because it lets those oils leave. But mm. if you batter salmon, you get that real um, essential oil sort of thing going. Yeah, you right. Know? Yeah, right. I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of that. And a few years ago, we got this... Um, there's this guy in the UK, he's a celebrity chef called Hugh Fernley Whittingstall. Mm -hmm. And he always takes on these big eco-warrior type challenges. And, you know, for the yeah. most part, he's very good. Pretty good guy. Mm -hmm. And he had this great idea of moving, and that's sarcastic, he had this great idea of moving people away from cod. I understand his, his, his worries, you know, yeah. I don't agree with them, but I understand. And he wanted to move people to mackerel. 
Now, fresh mackerel is a pelagic fish. I don't know if you do you get mackerel over there. I don't know. Yeah, right. yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. And yeah. and you know, it's a pelagic fish. It's quite mm. oily. And mm. I think the fresh window in the UK is about eight weeks a year, give or take. You know. Wow. So, okay. So, <laughs> and then everyone was battering it. And I remember like a load of my customers saying, "Oh, I did bad mackerel," and I was like, "Don't just bread it. Like it's going to be nicer if you can lose those essential oils." But obviously, I, look. It goes against me because I manufacture batters for a living. So. <laughs> I was going to say the one thing we should talk about is, is crumbing or grilling fish on this podcast. But No, I don't mind. I don't mind at all, <laughs> as long as you use some of our ingredients to do those things. <laughs> Look, why, just going back to that, why was he moving, trying to move people with mackerel? I think his theory was at the time, it's a few years back now, but his theory was that you'd move some people. Well, it was, un, it was underutilized, I guess, as a species mm -hmm. at the time. But, you know, for me, there's cod and haddock. And actually, I tell you, if you're ever in the UK, mm. we'll meet up and I'll take you to a great fish and chip shop. Well, the many great fish and chip shops that do fresh hake. Yeah. Mm. Like, I don't know if you, again, I don't know if you get hake over there, but it Probably is just. Something else. There's so many different fish varieties that are called. Yeah. The challenge in Australia is that in different parts of Australia, fish, the same fish is called different things. Okay. Yeah, we get a little bit of that over here, like, for example, okay. yeah, like there's rock salmon, for example, like mm -hmm. rock salmon is technically dogfish, like, but then they call okay. it, there's so many different names and, you know, you call yeah. it rock salmon because you link it to salmon, like, and you think, oh, it's nice now. I'm not a big fan of rock salmon. It's got, mm -hmm. it's like, it's a bit, I don't know how to explain it. It looks like a big eel, like, you know, it's oh, got wow. like a big thick bone going down it but it's got a very creamy texture the fish has again it's not my sort of thing like i don't know i'd, pro I'd prefer to have cod or haddock or hake uh, <laughs> but again each to their own and i think own, you know yeah. another nice species definitely skates which is a it's a it's a ray wing that was on the endangered species list but now you can yeah. use ray wing which isn't anymore mm. and it's a lovely product it's you know it's great it's so nice um i suppose how would you tart up fish and chips? Like, for example, I was laughing about this mm. earlier. One of my mates, he, uh, he opens a fish and chip shop a few years ago mm -hmm. and literally finally chops up parsley and sprinkles it on top of the fish and chips. Now, imagine doing that for hundreds of fish and chips a wow. day. Like, yeah. yeah. You know, and then he gets peed off doing it. He's like, I can't be asked now. <laughs> but then, like, 10 or 15 shops copy him. So now you've got all these shops all over the UK that just sprinkle parsley on top of fish and chips. <laughs> if you think but there's no function to it except for it looks nice on instagram but there's no actual function because you've chopped yeah. it up finely yes you know yes so the flavor component the parsley at well, that level is pretty inert isn't it yeah like, and like, i wouldn't think it's a massive thing right it's not like you're putting oh it in no 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 not at all like but for the most part the only variations you get is you know i suppose all right so we do a lot of product development so one of mm. our customers rings us up and says right i want i want a batter with wasabi in it and i'm like okay what's it going on a pea fritter and then there was mm -hmm. another customer that was like i want a paprika batter and and you know so we put all these flavor packets together all these components for people to put into batter mm. and i remember saying to one of the guys once like do you sell a lot of this and it's like no normal fish and chips is like 99 percent of what we do and i'm like <laughs> there you go like, you there, yeah. Yeah. yeah you know and i think i think we all want everyone has this tendency to want to make fish and chips mm. like, posher but elevate it a little bit but it's a working man's food like uh, it's it's for working men like you don't and women obviously but it's not you know it's not it's not a posh food in my view like and that's not to denigrate it it's just mm. not mm. fish and chips sorry to interject that fish and chips in australia does look different to me like you know it's frozen Mom, chips for the most well it's frozen chips for the most part one thing we talk about over here is that you know, a friend of mine we've been helping her she's just opened a fish and chip shop in in atlanta georgia and mm. she says the biggest complaint she gets is that the chips are thick well that's chips in the uk chips are thick yeah, in america fries. they're fried yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. so she really went on a out on a limb to buy the equipment from the UK to actually and find mm. the potatoes in America that do the right thing. And everyone's like, well, they're not fries. And she's like, yeah, because in Britain, you do have fries with burgers, generally. Not with fish and chips. They're chips. No, with fish Otherwise, chips. Otherwise, fish and fries. <laughs> exactly that. <you> know? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Hello. So, yeah. But apparently the Americans just couldn't get the concept. And in fact, and they didn't like the fact that 
I, I don't know, again, over there it might be different, but for a long time over here, fish and chips are wrapped in paper. And you do mm. get like a soggy chip. It's not always a crisp chip. We mm. have now elevated our packaging options. And, you know, you do get crispy chips. And many shops that I deal with would also do like a blanch chip. So it's a two-stage yep. process. Yep. You know, you will get a very crispy chip. But for the most part, her, her customers would say, no, why are these fries, these thick fries, why are they soggy? <laughs> You know, she just got really frustrated. <laughs> she was just like, look, you know, you're American. This is why you don't get it. Like, mm-hmm. but all the British people are like, whoa, they're proper chips. Like, they're proper chips. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're excited. You know. So, so, so does that, are you saying, let's have a chip, let's have a chip talk for a second. Because I think that's important. <laughs> you know, that's not batter though, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. This is not, this is not sponsored by Simplot. We're okay. Does that mean that? In the UK, like it's customary for fish and chip shops to not have frozen chips and to do fresh. I would imagine. And I don't know if I'm exaggerating here because I have a tendency to do such a thing, according to my <laughs> wife. But 99.9999% of fish mm. and chip shops will be using potatoes. Right. Then, I mean, I mean I fresh, potatoes. Yeah. fresh <laughs> potatoes. Well, no, no, actually, because I was going to I was going to go one step further and say that okay. there is probably about 15 percent of those that buy pre prepared chips. So right. you've got about three or four factories in the UK and uh-huh. they will be peeling them daily and chipping them and then uh-huh. sending them out in a vacuum pack. Right. So but then, right. Refrigerated backpack. Yeah. No, no, no. Chilled, chilled because they're done uh-huh. daily. They're, they're great quality for me. Yeah. And it's just my personal opinion. They're not as good as doing them yourself daily. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, but I would say that 80%, if not more, of the industry is doing them on site every day with a proper potato peeler, as in a rumbler. It's so like you could do 25 yeah, yeah, peelers yeah. in one. 20, yeah. <laughs> Where are we? Yeah. And then are they cooking them straight in the fryer or what are they doing? Are they blanching them? And then, because I've seen so many different methods of doing it fresh. So what they do for the most part, again, not all, but I'd say again, like in the 90%, like Mm. for the most part, they'll get chipped, they'll get de-starched and they'll get what we call dry whited. So that that basically it's a, it's a sodium metabisulfite solution. It's not dangerous at all. It sounds it, but it's not. Mm. Um, And then basically it's, um, it's to stop oxidization. You know what it's like? You cut a potato, leave it. Yeah, right. You you do that. And then I think they leave them for like, 30 minutes i don't know it's been a long time since i've done it they give them a rinse or pull the plug and then put them to one side and they stay out dry and the, the air doesn't bother them and then they would yeah. and, and then it, there's a bit of a split between who blanches and who doesn't but i yeah. would again think the majority are cooking straight through and then the minority would be blanching i would say the point of blanching would be to get a crispier chip yes i would imagine yeah but uh-huh. also the fact that you're doing a lot of your preparation in advance so if you can blanch off like oh, you know okay. say yeah, like a seven-minute process. You blanch it. You've got some ready. When a customer comes in and orders fish and chips, you mm. just drop a basket in at really high temperature and finish them off. It is a superior. I I love a blanched chip. I, I love I've done properly. I love a blanched chip. Right, because so many of them will like cook it twice or cook it three times. Like a big thing. Yeah, for a while was like, oh, we've got you know. Well, right. that we've got like, Heston Blumenthal to like thank right? for that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, like, it's just a triple cooked chip is a steak chip. We're talking 21 mil by 21 mil. Like mm-hmm. it's a very thick chip and mm-hmm. that can withstand that three-step process. Yeah. You know, any yeah. anything would pro- anything else under that would probably disintegrate, if I'm honest. Like, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. we're pretty obsessive and I'll throw something else in here as well. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got we've got an amazing customer in Exmouth, which is Southwest, and they batter their chips. Yeah. And we're not talking about like a normal batter here. Like you can get normal stodgy batters that go on top, mm. but we've helped them develop this batter. We make it for mm-hmm. them. So it's mm-hmm. very good. <laughs> and it tastes amazing. Like I, I, where we're from, there's a place called like, so I'm in the Midlands and it's not far mm. away. It's the black country, they call it. And mm. that's because it was a whole mining town, metal town, everything. Oh, okay. Yeah. And they essentially invented like the, the batter chip. These guys do it so much better. I would never eat a batter chip. You wouldn't, and I make batter. You would never see yeah. me eat a batter chip. And then yeah. I was down there and they were like, here, still have some chips. You know, you develop the products. So you've got to try yeah. it. And I was like, okay, then. And I eat them and all like, I need more. Like, they're so good. Like, because the you've got a rough surface. Yeah. Uh-huh. So the rougher surface has already got flavor in it. So we've got a bit of salt in there, a nice spice, mm. a nice spice profile in there. Mm-hmm. It's a great product from starch to make it go crispy. And mm-hmm. then, well, it accepts more salt and vinegar because it's a rough surface. If it's a smooth cool. surface, it just rolls straight off. 
But yeah, when right. it's a rough surface, you've got all these little crags and oh, salt and vinegar just gets everywhere. And I love salt and vinegar on it. So, no. Uh, do you guys even do curry sauce or mushy peas? Like, what's the deal? Like, oh, uh, mushy peas, sort of. Curry sauce, sort, <laughs> sort of. But I mean, those are the those are the two. Like, mushy peas, yes. Like some venues, you'll do that. But you know, it's it's English people who are going to order that, right? Like, I love it. I'm obviously not English. <laughs> it's kind of like to get it somewhere good. Like, it's pretty tough. Um, curry sauce, like curry sauce, is not really a thing. I'll I'll tell you a fun story. So in in um. <laughs> 2017 2017 yeah it was 2017 i had um i'd finished a pretty big um consulting gig and i had a i had a friend at the time who said hey oh no sorry i went to him i had a i (laughs) i'm not telling this story well it's that um (laughs) (laughs) i knew a company that had like a food truck park right so i had a food truck park they had a big big bar and um and they wanted more vendors for this um chicken nugget festival (laughs) <laughs> right, and it was the first time they were going to do a chicken nugget festival. They're going to bring about six or seven different vendors doing different styles or types or um, experimentations with chicken nuggets. And we did this thing called a dough nug, right? <laughs> Which is basically chicken mints, yeah, um, uh, crumbed in the shape of a donut, right? Okay. So it looked like a donut with a hole in the middle, so you could pick it up okay. like a donut, <clears throat> deep fried. Right, so it's in America. In America, like this is a thing, apparently. <laughs> That's it. Blame it on them. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I don't know if it's a good thing or bad thing. So, it's a, so it's a chicken donut, and then and then we had three different sauces, and one of the sauces because he was he is Irish. He's Irish or Scottish? Apologies, I don't, I don't, mean, to put it, I don't mean to put it together. It's just been a while since I've talked to him and heard his voice. No, he's Scottish, and 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 yeah, one of them he wanted to do with with curry sauce, and it went off. It went off. So curry sauce is not really a thing here, but when it is and done well, like it's a, it's a big thing. But yeah. um, I, th- I think I, th- I would have thought a hey, the fact that there's a lot of Brits over there, or at least was Brits, and then yeah. the fact that you're close to Asia, I would have thought maybe a curry sauce would have been you know an interesting thing. But then again, I suppose maybe you just go to the Asian restaurants and you get the curry sauce. Who knows? But yeah. No, really. curry sauce isn't a curry sauce, though. I'm not being funny. Like, we're not even culturally appropriating. Like, if you mm. took that curry sauce to like India or China, there'd be faint similarities, but they, they get, mm. we call it, I call it, I've always categorized it as a British curry sauce. And everyone says, well, how can it be British? And I'll say, because Indian is somewhere to the left and then mm. Chinese is somewhere to the right. Mm. You know, one of my pet hates is aniseed in fish and chip curry sauce. I hate it. Oh, right. Like, if you've ever done development with aniseed, it just mm. the, the aniseed oil right. just right. yeah takes over, cloaks your tongue. And I say this to people all the time. And uh, Chinese curry sauce is quite popular in the UK for fish and chip shops. Mm-hmm. And I'll say to them like, and I'll do tests all the time. And I'll say, look, have you ever considered trying a, a chip shop curry sauce, like a good quality chip shop curry sauce? Well, no, we always done Chinese. We've always done Chinese. Mm. And every test we've done, after looking back over a week, the British curry sauce sales rocket. And the Chinese set us back. And what we find is that most people say, once they try them side by side, they say, that one needs chicken. Make it a curry that I can eat with rice. And the other one, I want my fish and chips because a fish and chip curry sauce, it's a delicate balance of sort of sweetness, spice. You know, I always say, if you close your eyes, you almost want to sort of taste raisins, you know. And, and that's mm-hmm. because for a long time, raisins were in curry sauce, mm-hmm. right? You know. Yeah, absolutely. That's how I know it. So, yeah, what well, everyone wants over here now, everyone wants smooth curry sauce, right? So. Interesting. I mean, yeah. I mean, curry from when I was, you know, when I was in the UK five years ago, like I knew that curry was a massive thing in the UK. Yeah. But I didn't realize how massive it was. Like compared oh, to Australia, a, like it's not, yeah. it's, um, it's just a. What do you have? Tartar sauce, mayonnaise, ketchup? What? <laughs> Don't tell me you have it dry. <laughs> 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 no, tartar sauce, of course. Yeah, yeah. Tartar sauce and mayo. Yeah. And we have, you know, tomato sauce. We also have ketchup. <laughs> We say tomato sauce, right? We just say whatever it says on the tin, man. Ketchup, tomato <laughs> sauce. I think I would be classed as a commoner, so I would say ketchup. Yeah. My friend might say tomato sauce. <laughs> They're two different products, though. How are they? Heinz tomato ketchup. Sauce and ketchup are different. Go on, explain. Well, tomato sauce usually has more, is usually thinner, slightly thinner, and usually got more sugar in it than ketchup. I don't think we have. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. American ketchup. I was going to say, I might be wrong. Friends, customers, listeners will tell me this, but I don't think I'm we curious. have cheap. We have cheap 
still. Yeah, we have cheap ketchup, don't get me wrong, and then we have Heinz. Yeah. yeah? And then there's right. everything in between. But uh-huh. we don't give them different names. Yeah, no, no, no. Two completely different products here. Oh, okay. Well, maybe I'm wrong. I'm going to get like a whole like what? <laughs> yeah. Everyone's just going to call me posh now because apparently I only buy Heinz. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I wanted to say, actually, I've been listening to a couple of your podcasts. Thank you. And uh, I've been packing away loads of boxes today, loads of online okay. orders today. And I was in the garage doing some of that. And I listened to the one, <clears throat> and congratulations, you know, 100 episodes. I know you're on 103 now, but, mate, that's a big milestone. Thank you. Like, you, know, Thank you. Appreciate I'm, it. I'm, I'm now, I'm, I'm a bit jealous. I'm aiming for that number now. So. <laughs> you're going to get to 200 very, very quickly, I reckon. Gonna, I reckon you're going to overtake me soon. Only if I can annoy enough people. Um, <laughs> so, so, it's a speciality of mine. So, um, so, so uh, yeah, I was really impressed with, like, you know, that guy, you know, all those sites he's got, you know, the Baker's Pride. It's Baker's Pride, wasn't it? Oh, Baker's Delight. Baker's Delight, yeah. So yeah, I was yeah, going to, yeah, like, that's a, big, that's a big thing going off there. Yeah, so, like, a bit of context to that. It was quite, it was quite interesting to do that podcast. So it, it had come up to nearly 100 podcasts. Um, and so Baker's Delight is where I started my career, right, when I was 16. And Bakes Delight is like one of the biggest fresh bread retailers in the world. Um, they've got roughly, you know, sort of 700 sites in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and America. Uh, so they're called Cobb's Bread in, in Canada and America. Yeah, it was quite full circle. And I got, a, I got a, and they're celebrating their 40th birthday at the moment. And I got a got an email from someone in their PR company saying, "Do you want to do you want to interview the CEO?" And I'm like, oh. I emailed back and I went, "Do you know who I am? Because I was there for 11 years and owned two sites." Yeah, and she's like, "Oh, that'd be that'd be really good." So that I mean, that worked out really well. It was really good to was, uh, to touch base with Dave again. Yeah, been a couple of years, so it was good. It's weird because when we first like we got introduced, and I genuinely yeah. thought, "Who's going to want to hear what I've got to say in Australia?" Like, and I was listening to that with him, and I mm. genuinely related to it. Like, he's he's yeah. no way near me. He's a, he's South African. Oh no, where was he from? Uh, yeah, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. Sorry, the, yeah, the shot. Yeah, you know, <laughs> um, you know. So he's from. Zimbabwe, you know, he's in Australia. He spent a bit of time in the UK. I've got nothing that really relates to that guy at all. Like, you know, mm. the fact that he's hugely successful, <laughs> like, you know. And, yes. and yeah, I was listening to him thinking, whoa. Like, and then when he was talking about how every location starts with nothing because they're buying the flour and making everything on site every day. And that's mm. alien to how we know large business. For the most part, everything's it's Every, you know, for the most part in food businesses, you know, it's like yeah. Ikea, isn't it? Everything comes yeah. in and you assemble it. And I just found that incredible because baking is an absolute skill. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to throw a bit of that and it'll be all right. Like, you know, like no. you, just, you know, and to just leave that to like franchisees, I guess they've got obviously, look, he's not just leaving it to franchisees. There's a, but yeah, there is an element there, right? So, I mean, I yeah. spent, 11, like, as I just said, like uh, 11 years of my career there. and yeah, like there's never been another retail. There's never been another brand that I can put next to it because you you simply start every day fresh. You don't like you literally don't have any product. The only the only time the only time it could be left over is like mince pies, right? If you baked <clears throat> yeah. maybe two mince pies at Christmas time and you can keep them three or four days, you can honestly keep them three or four months. <laughs> um, but we, we weren't doing that. Other than that, like nothing compares to it. Like like when I've worked in restaurants or whatever, like you've always had things you've prepped the day before which you can use, you know, sorry, you can use the next day and, and that kind of stuff. Like there's there's par levels and things like that. But but and baking is just like I'm sure so many people who are listening to this still like tried to bake during lockdown, you know, mm. that would always the new thing. And realized that it's not easy. And it's not. Like it's 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 just a, it's a constant dance and, and it's just really, really difficult to consistently get it right because there are so many variables that you wouldn't think of. Like, like a lot of your listeners would know from like batter and what you'd know from flour, right? Is that, you mm. know, flour changes seasonally. Yeah. Sometimes it needs more water. Sometimes it needs less water. Sometimes it's going to react a certain way. So all those things are variables. Temperature is a massive variable with bakeries. You know, things take a lot longer to rise when it's cold and, winter time and a lot quicker in summer and all those kind of things like so it definitely told me how to be patient people don't see well the consistency how important consistency is one of my customers says how do you manage to always keep the batter the same and i'll say to him well we we keep it the same and it's a paradox 
because it's always different. And yes. he's like, well, that doesn't make sense. I'm like, because in the back end, we're constantly fine tuning. It never actually stops. If we notice that the wheat is a certain strength, certain protein, we adjust something. And it's a mm. constant, not a battle, but it's a game you're constantly playing. Yeah. And obviously we have got newer flowers these days and better crops and so on. And but mm -hmm. yeah, the, the game is the same. You're always you're always trying to master it and make it better. And, yep. and one of the things I know is I love development. It's something I get really excited about. And mm -hmm. I love a challenge, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when we did our gluten-free batter, it became a thing over here for a while. People again you know everyone was hating on gluten oh it's bad for you it's not bad for you it's yes. fine but, yeah you know, exactly the, the crucial aspect that gluten has in batter is pretty unknown everyone no one mm. realizes and we mm. when we started the development of our gluten-free batter we spent two months just monitoring what gluten does to batter that was it well, just two, we didn't even mix it like we didn't even bring flowers in but what people don't realize is that gluten actually suspends particles so mm -hmm. if you imagine like um an invisible honeycomb yeah mm -hmm. and you put batter in a clear tube you can mm -hmm. see that throughout that whole tube you've got bubbles all the way through it's co2 yes. bubble yeah what's making them suspend why aren't they just floating to the top mm. well one of the reasons is gluten formation mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. traps bubbles. Now, in baking, what you get there is you work the gluten. We do it the opposite way to making batter. You add water to flour, let's say, whereas in batter yes. making, we add flour to water. We, right. we do the opposite. We don't want to aggravate the gluten. We don't want it to overwork, whereas in yes, exactly. bakery, you want it to overwork. Exactly. It, yeah. So, so it's it's almost the exact opposite science, and 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 you know you you put uh, bread to prove in a warm place and it swells up. Well, that's the gluten formation. Mm -hmm. So we spent two months just literally writing notes on how, what happens. And one of the things we know, for example, we know what batter looks like when people have kept it overnight. We know that, for example, um, batter. If you leave it overnight, you'll get what we call like a, it ferments and you get like an alpha amylase separation, which is like where the water comes out of the wheat. We know that oh, for okay. every hour you leave it out, you get one millimeter of water separation. So you come back in the morning, it's like six mil of water like that. And mm -hmm. you just, it's fermented. And that's how you'd make sourdough, which is yeah. great for bread, like, but for batter. <laughs> Awful, it, right? it's not nice. It's going to give you a really oily product. It's going to taste quite strong. And again, in bread, that's desirable, you yes. know, you know, but in batter, not so much. And, and I think we were always testing things. And I think once we figured out how to emulate gluten formation in a non gluten containing product, like mm. that was it. Like, and then you can start choosing what you want to, what you want that end product to be like. And yes, and I think for me, just like you, I guess, product development is an exciting phase, the unknowing, the not knowing, and then start knowing. I don't know. It's just something about it that gets me really excited. Yeah, I totally agree. It's always the best part of any kind of my job is when we're doing menu development and when we're trying to understand it. Um, I was going to ask you, like, has the gluten-free trend, I'll call it a trend, <laughs> please don't hurt me, has that, has that, has that come off a bit? Have you, have I think you found it, like, it, batter sales? Have you found that, if I can ask you, like, has that come off a bit? Because what I noticed in, in lockdown was the fact that when you walk into a suit, like, remember, you know, late March, mid March, and, and, and everyone was panicking, right? And, yeah. and all the bread was gone. <laughs> gluten free bread was still there. Like, yeah. you know, where are all the gluten intolerant people now? Like, I'm just curious if, think, if it's changed. I, in I this think time. what you've probably seen is that. Even before COVID, COVID probably really um, nailed it. But mm. I think the vegan movement is now the vegan movement. Yes. Uh, it is, is a the really strong movement, right? Yeah. It's consistent. It's not going away. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is. And I think, but everyone said this about gluten as well. Gluten-free, shall yeah. I say. But, I mean, everyone I spoke to four years ago, gluten-free, gluten-free. Like, everyone was rushing mm. to get gluten-free products out. And and I remember my mum, typical case. Oh, I've heard gluten's really bad, so she'll go down the gluten free aisle and get gluten free biscuits, we've had, which have ten times more shit than the wheat based biscuits. Yeah. Like, yeah. And and yeah. and you think, well, you know, again, when we brought out gluten free range products, they were actually technically allergen free. So we spent mm -hmm. a little bit more time and just said, you know what, let's just make it clean deck all the way through. Mm -hmm. And and I think the the key thing to know is that in the UK, people don't get this like. 
gluten isn't actually the biggest allergen. It's actually mm. out of the 14 allergens, soya is the biggest allergen in the UK. Really? Glu yeah. Gluten is the biggest allergen in Europe. And that's why they, they, they took a real strong stance on it. And the symptoms are very similar. A friend of mine, his wife, she used to eat fish and chips and she used to get really bloated. Yep. And then when they started using our batter mix, she, he goes, oh, you got to try it. So she tries it and she didn't feel sick. And she goes, oh, I didn't mm. feel sick. And he goes, well, must be the batter then. So then we figured out just by that accident, that happy accident, that she was allergic to soya. And then oh, she's got right. soya out of her diet. And, and I think soya isn't, it's not really, um, it's not native to the UK. And I think there is some, if we use soya in a recipe, in our recipes, we make sure it's fermented soya, so like soy sauce, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they say you shouldn't really have non-fermented soya because it's estrogenetic. So, yeah. so yeah. men start to grow boobs. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've, had, I've had a conversation with... <laughs> With um, with a guy about that before on the podcast, and he said that that's that's BS. Still, well, I don't, I don't think it is. I, 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 look. You reckon it's true? You reckon it's true? The, okay. The, the fact is that soya is estrogenetic. You know, it, you know, no mm. one's making that up. Like, you know, why would they? And I think, and I think, look, maybe there's different qualities of soya. Clearly, you know, mm -hmm. problem is a lot of these vegetable oils, and I'm quite hard on vegetable oils because I don't mm. find that. They're good for people. They're a mm. weak product to frying, number one. Very mm -hmm. weak. Anything low in saturated fat, I wouldn't touch for frying because it's not mm -hmm. robust enough, you know. And then, you know, a friend of mine, he packs off soy oil. And he said to me that frying ranges, which are made out of metal, so they're made out of steel, mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. said after four years of frying in soy oil, the welds came off. Yeah. So, wow. you know, and now look, that's anecdotal, like, you sure. know, you know, it's it's one or two cases, but mm -hmm. you know, you can see how you know if I know look, it's not to say that we're all the same, like, but I do think that if Brit British people aren't used to eating soya, you can mm. see why. And 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 there's a reason why the Japanese and the Chinese mostly have it fermented, you know. And 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 I think you know, Point. you know, even tofu's fermented, like so. Mm. So I think, why why would you then say? But and here's I don't know if you know much about this, and you might. But mm -hmm. for example, liquid oils that come from vegetables, yes. um, and they're not vegetables; they're not carrots. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yes. mostly seeds. Yeah. Yes. So seeds, yeah. they blend it with hexane, which wow. is basically okay. a paint stripper. Yeah. So yes. you you blend it to extract. It's a solvent. You get all the liquid out mm -hmm. of the oil. Out mm -hmm. of the. Yeah, I'm not being funny. Uh, let's think of a let's think of all like yeah i think rapeseed oil which is uh, did you guys call it rapeseed or canola over there yeah no great yeah, yeah. Well, rapeseeds is a very small amount of oil like you know mm. but i think you get 40 percent extraction where well, you add hexane it lifts it all up so yeah, and, right. and then they put it for another process to get rid of the hexane so i'm not i'm not talking about voodoo or you know, mm. like, you know mm. this is what they do for liquid oil over here they do use liquid oils like rapeseed um ground oil um, sunflower oil, high lake sunflower oil. They're very low in, in, in saturated fat. And for me, mm. they don't give you a crispy product unless it's high, unless it's higher lake, which is then high in monounsaturated fat. But I would avoid polyunsaturated fats all day long for frying, all day long. You know, I'm a bit obsessed with oils, to be fair, because I think that it's the main thing, the constituent of, of what you're yeah. frying, you know. So Absolutely. palm oil gets such a bad rap, real bad. But if you get it from a sustainable source, and mm. we can, they're available. Mm. A friend of mine, he manufactures and well, he imports and manufactures single estate, single source palm oil, fair oh trade, name it. Yeah. So yeah. it can be good, but people mm. you know, make, instead of banning palm oil, they should say we're banning bad palm oil. Yeah. It's a bit like what should happen in um I mean it's 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 kind of happened in kind of happened. It has has, has happened in coffee, right? The fact mm. you've got a third wave coffee movement and stuff like that, it's sort of starting to happen with tea. With they're starting to talk about fair trade tea, um, because <laughs> tea is largely not fair trade, and I and I think that's got to come through. You know, all these kind of products that we don't think about where the source of the product comes from, what labor goes into that, like what are we doing environmentally, sustainably about those products? Like it's really 
it's a really important conversation that we need to you know I continue think, having one of the things i'd say about coffee chocolate cocoa shall i say mm. Mm-hmm. fair trade is actually not that good either and again yeah. that's another that's another big thing like but i think i did a podcast with a coffee guy a couple of weeks ago and i did one a year ago and a friend of mine also has a really great coffee business over here coffee roasting business mm-hmm. and they say like fair normal coffee on the market let's say a robusta bean is a, is a dollar a, a pound yeah mm-hmm. well mm-hmm. fair trade's only 160 a fair trade, really, if you read the fair trade policy, it is to say, oh, people should get fair wage and everything. But yes, actually, sure. it's a volume driven thing. It's actually saying mm. we need the volume. If we ain't got the volume, and that tells you why people like Nestle are behind it, McDonald's are behind mm. it. I don't know, at least it's a good minimum barrier. But it's mm. like, you know, the guy I spoke to last week, he said, really, if it was $3 a pound, he goes, then you know they're getting a good living. Like, you know, you yeah, know, right. you know. And he mm. goes, what's wrong with forcing it at $3 a pound? This guy, mate, like, he, He's doing like coffee that's like he's paying thousand pound, you know. He's like top end. He supplies like Michelin star yeah. restaurants with coffee. Like, yeah. you know, yeah, and he's yeah. saying, look, clearly not everyone can do that. Like, but yeah. if it was yes. three dollars a pound, then you know everyone's getting a good, a, a, a good living out of that. It's kind of how it breaks down through the supply chain, right? If you think about coffee and you think about what you buy at a coffee shop, might be you know that three dollar a pound coffee. But then we're happy to sort of, if we're doing freeze dried coffee or something like that at home, then we're happy for that to be low grade coffee. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit like free range eggs. We want we want that to be you know free range when we fry it. But if it's in mayonnaise's, then are we okay for that to be caged? Like it's it's an interesting um interesting yeah, conversation. I'm not sure if we can still get caged in the UK, I, and I'm, I might be wrong, but I swear they were like talking about Wasn't getting. Jamie Oliver doing something about. Yeah, probably. It? Yeah, you see, Jamie Oliver was a really like interesting guy. A lot of people yeah. hate him, you know. Like, I don't know why. Yeah. Like, yeah, why? honestly, like he gets so much hate. Like, I don't even know why. Like, I, like don't get me wrong, he gets a lot of love too. <laughs> There's going to be an element to that, clearly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think that he's too polite, in my view. Look at Gordon Ramsay. Who's going to mm. hate Gordon Ramsay? He's going to tell everyone to do one, isn't he? Yeah. But with Jamie Oliver, he's too nice, isn't he? So he's like, oh, you know, like oh. You know, I'm not going to swear, like, because I've got a family. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Gordon yeah, Ramsay, yeah. like, if he's sticking the Vs up and everything, you don't give a crap. Like, but I think, no, I think because with, with Jamie Oliver, I think because he's had a bit of trouble, you know, like, he's been bankrupt and it's not his fault. Like, yeah. but you know, he still yeah. does very well. But one of his businesses went, well, maybe two of his businesses went bankrupt. But I think people yeah. use that as a sledgehammer sometimes. But he's, he's, I think his heart's in the right place, not being funny. He's going the same to schools, cook better food for kids. Why yeah. would you have a problem with that? Like, I don't... <laughs> yeah, why is it a bad thing? It's yeah. not like he's bringing in his own product. And well, then, you can see how that would be a conflict of interest, that, right? Yeah, yeah, it would be a massive conflict. I mean, yeah. he's not. You know, he's he's been lobbying governments and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, like, yeah. and he's gone above and beyond. He doesn't have to do that. He can just be a TV celeb and a business person and say stuff everyone else. Course. You know, yeah. But, his own soft range and then bugger off. Like he's 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 actually trying to do things that are going to change the industry. I think that's something. Yeah, I I I think that yeah. You know, sometimes it's really obvious. Cook better food in schools. Well, why would that be a hard thing to co- comprehend? Like, I yeah, I think it, I, I have a feeling it all comes down to people not wanting to change and then price. Yeah, could be could be price. You yeah. Know? yeah, yeah. But, I don't know, man. I, I know. Do you do any consulting with schools or anything like that over there? What's the food like over there in schools? Oh, we don't really – we don't have the school program that, you know, the UK and the, and the US seem to have where they, you know, sort of feed them on – feed you guys, like, in lunchrooms and that kind of stuff. Like, that doesn't happen. There's not, like, a big lunchroom that everyone gets – Pack lunches maybe or – Yeah, it's like pack lunches or there's, you know, what we'll call like a, um, a tuck shop or a canteen depending what um, – state you're in Australia, it's called different things. And um and then you go there and, you know, buy more sandwiches or sushi or pies or whatever. It's ready to go but food then. Ready to go food. Yeah. Rather than rather it sounds than, a bit uh, like Cyprus that does actually. Like I did a year in Cyprus when I was at school mm-hmm. and literally it was just mm-hmm. like that. It was like you go to the little box and you know, and they take yeah, they say, well, what do you want? Oh sausage roll. Great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, yeah. it was like very simple food. Yeah. You know. So it's all that because the UK is like trays and stuff, right? So you go into yeah, a big loaf room. So for the most and then part, yeah. You queue up and 
Yeah, mate, they're um, into the profit over it, mate. Like they know that they're milk, you know. Like my kid is obsessed. He's six years old and he's obsessed with um two American shows. One's called uh, no, sorry, Australian shows for kids. Mm-hmm. One's called The Investigators and one's called Little mm-hmm. Lunch. He's obsessed with it. And I said to him, like, Alex, like, do they not eat around the table like at lunchtime? And he goes, No, they're just eating the playground with like sandwiches and stuff. Like, yeah, great. And, and yet I said to him, What do you do at school? He goes, Oh, we all sit around the table in the uh in the hall, let's say. Yes. And 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 I, and I thought that was a complete, and it just made me think, like, and I know it's a yeah, kid's thing. That. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's interesting, yeah. isn't it? Sometimes, uh, like, at, um, I remember at um, primary school, we used to have to, so the, the bell would ring for lunch, and let's say we had, like, 45 minutes or an hour for lunch or whatever it was, and we had to sit there and eat for 10 minutes <laughs> before we can go play. We couldn't go play. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, that's how it was. And then you could go play if you wanted to, like yeah. in, until, until the end of lunch. So yeah, it's very, very different to what the UK and the US is like. Mm. So how, mm. does, how do you get into consultancy? You work at the bakery, you had a couple yourself, you know, yes. you, you mentioned that you had a bit of a tricky time as well. Uh, how do yeah, you get yeah, yeah. into, you know, um, consultancy? Do consultancy. Um, it's a good question. So yeah, I had a I had a couple of bakeries in my twenties. I had a car accident which put me out of commission, and I went into liquidation. Um, I then uh, went over to Vancouver and tried to open some bakeries for um, for Cobbs Cobbs Bread over there. Then came back because my um, ex partner couldn't get a visa, so we came back. Um, and then I started to work in cafes, and then I, I worked for a brand called Grilled, which um, hopefully. Excuse me. A lot of um, a lot of people might know. So it's like it's a bit like GBK, yeah. Um, in the in the UK, and um, but they were uh, a very sort of up and coming brand at the time I joined them, sort of two thousand and seven, two thousand and I was two thousand and eight, and had about ten restaurants across the country. And then I moved to, so I moved from Adelaide to Vancouver to Brisbane, and then I yeah, so I lived in Brisbane for six years with working for Grilled and um, opening up restaurants for them um and then i went to perth for six months in my last six months of there and um uh stabilized a couple of restaurants over there and and then left the company so i'd I'd lived all around australia at that point and then um and then five and a half years ago i came to work in melbourne um started work with a um uh, a celebrity chef um, at the time who had a couple of different brands and, and worked in one of their restaurants and didn't last very long and um it was one of his qsr qsr brands and um and then went back into bakeries so uh i ran a bakery brand for for a year um doing production logistics so i went sort of went back home almost and um and that was super fun because i was dealing with um amazing french uh boulangers and 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 pastry chefs and stuff like that it was really really high level high quality um we actually supplied um, Heston Blumenthal's restaurant um, here that he had here in Melbourne, um, and that so that was in that that was amazing, um, and and then I left that, and then um, I had a friend of a friend who was opening up a burger restaurant, um, and said, "Hey, you've you've opened a lot. I've probably opened about ten or fifteen, and um, can you help?" And I said, "Sure," and I just started it and started consulting and that sort of just rolled on and opened a um, fried chicken brand from Singapore here in Australia and uh, opened their three locations and did basically the whole end to end from supply chain recruitment to helping with site selection and fit outs and that kind of stuff. And that was cool. And then, um, and then the last couple of years I've, I've sort of worked for a couple of brands as well, like with their brand rather than being a consultant and uh, that's taking me into salads and it's taking me into chocolate and desserts and stuff like that. So there's a lot of different areas of the industry that I never thought I'd work in when I started my baking career at 16. Um, so I've sort of worked in every segment bar sort of uh, fine dining and pubs. So um, I haven't done pubs. I'd love to do a pub. Really? Um, but, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I always feel home in a pub. Mm-hmm. Okay, really, it's really, job, really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Like the way, uh, when I went through a really bad, um, uh, I, I got married and then separated. And I found, and when I was living in Brisbane, I found that me going to this particular pub who used to supply 
my my rest my grilled restaurant at the time. So I used to go there and have beers every Sunday, and I found that that was like the highlight of my week and a really grounded experience to go in a pub, see people I knew, have a couple of pints. Um, at that point, I was sort of doing some work to get myself ready for the week at work and stuff like that, um, and it was good. It just felt it just felt like a the, like a family. There is something and that's what I love about pubs. There is something about a pub that just makes you feel at home. Like even if you don't know yes. them, like, the only place I'd say yeah. that I've been into a pub and I didn't feel at home and I felt actually quite scared. It was like it's yeah. Belfast. Like you don't you don't just walk wow. into up. Yeah, and my customer said what to me, that? "What Belfast, was the difference? Belfast is um." It's a hotbed, like real hotbed, because islands split, and I don't want to get into the whole thing. But some people, you know, yes. some people love Britain, some people don't. You know, mm, you could, and you could easily Belfast. You could easily walk into the wrong pub. <laughs> so, right, okay. so, and, and you know, so yeah, like whichever way you land on, really. And I'm Cypriot, well, born in the UK, but you know, it probably gets me landed into more crap anyway. So it's like, <laughs> you know. but yeah, I was just walking around one day, and my customer goes, "Don't just walk around, like you know." So you know, you've got to know where you are, really, Belfast. Yeah, it's, it's a nice place, lovely place, really nice. Yeah. That's why you want to walk around because it's so nice, like you know. Yeah. But it's yeah. a really interesting thing I hear about the UK, especially with things like um, um, football, right? You call it, I call it soccer. <laughs> you, you call it football. <laughs> and, and the fact that certain teams, sorry, certain supporters can only go to certain pubs, right? Like you wouldn't see, I don't know, Manchester United and Manchester City supporters in the same pub, right? That wouldn't on a, happen on a local level, I guess. That's a thing, yeah. But then that would be the uh-huh. same for uh, if we was to talk about politics. That'd be the same if you if you're a Labour supporter, you probably won't go to the Conservative club either. I'm, I'm not saying right. they're not going to get they're not going to get all Larry. They're not going to start punching each other. But in football, obviously, there was. I, I'm not a huge football fan, but you know. You know, I would imagine a Tottenham fan wouldn't be one having a beer with an Arsenal fan, uh, and especially on match day. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, um, uh, but yeah, I think. But I don't know. I don't know if it's as bad as it was. Like, I, I don't. You know, I think the right, 80s okay. and the nineties was proper. Like, you know, but right. Okay, I that's don't good. Think, yeah, okay. we don't really have that here. Like, it's right. Like, it's rivalry, and like my team, yeah. my uh, what we call AFL here, right? Yeah. Australian Rules Football. So Google that if you've never heard of it before. <laughs> Is proper football. Yeah, of and... course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> like, I know very little about football. And I know that if you're going to watch a football match, it's either going to be the Premier League or the European team. Sorry, mate. Like, yeah. like I, I don't... anyway, we'll, we'll forget you. For this, <laughs> and I'm and... just defending my, my customer base what? here. <laughs> I know zero <laughs> about football. <laughs> Who's this Australian guy? Um, and <laughs> so when my team was in the grand final in 2017, um, like I was in the place where I knew the opposition team would be, like the supporters would be, and I went to that pub and and that kind of stuff, and unfortunately lost. And and I was barracking the whole time, and 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 really good, but no one wanted to hurt me. They were buying me beers at the end because they felt sorry. <laughs> Joking aside, like talking about hooliganism for a second, I, I went to a football match in Cyprus once, and I was with my best mate over there mm. and watching the match, and like proper you've never like we think we've seen racism yeah yeah when you go yeah, Cyprus, right. it's a different level and and uh-huh. they were they were having players like play for the teams from ivory coast and um i guess that was probably the most the most for the most part where they were coming from and i remember yeah. like i remember hearing someone shout out something really racist like i mean yeah. like and don't get me wrong i'm not like i'm not shy i'm from you know we know people mm. who, you know what i mean i've heard you know, nothing as bad as this though like so i, I look at, and i i look at my best man and i was like who who who's he shouting at he goes he goes he's on our own team like he was being <laughs> racist to a guy on his own team whereas i think oh, like, don't get me wrong you get the odd knobhead in the uk who will probably be yeah. racist against someone on the opposite side of the team but in cyprus yeah. they were racist against their own team own players yeah wow. like and honestly the, the stuff i heard like and i again i'm not a shy person like you know every yeah. other word out of my mouth is a swear word like and to hear yeah. this i was just like Whoa, like, took you back to it. Yeah. You know, yeah, and you know, and it was very unsafe. They were throwing fireworks, they were throwing like flares. In the UK, I don't think I've ever felt like that, even if I was probably standing mm. next to someone who was on the other side. 
So, mm -hmm. and, and I think rugby and cricket is very, very safe over here as well. Like rugby, the, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I understand that, that there's no issues there at all. So, but I don't think I, I, I you know, when I was younger, I used to go watch Leicester City and there was never an mm -hmm. issue there. Like, and again, I don't feel like, you know, maybe a local derby, but yeah, I, just, I don't think it's an issue no more. I think that's good to hear. Yeah, I feel safe. Good. I feel safe to come back to England. That's all yeah, right. Yeah, you should come. Like, honestly, <laughs> we'll look after you. You know. So you know, Mate, talking know. about like, I didn't want to mention this, but you sort of mentioned it a bit, and I know it's not the same person, yeah. but do you, do you guys have a lot of issues with like in hospitality with like staff issues? Because I saw that on the news of the week. Well, no, I saw when I was doing some research about Australia mm -hmm. that that mm -hmm. chef George Columbaris got into trouble yeah. with the chef. Like, yeah. is that a regular yeah. thing over there? Like, not just him. I mean, like in the hospitality industry, like. Yeah. So you, yeah. So <laughs> remember when I told you I moved to Melbourne? Yeah. That was, that was the chef that. I oh, okay. To, right? So, um, and he's, um, George is a fantastic guy. So he was, he was, and that's not the reason I left as well. Like he was largely saying everything the industry was thinking, you know, about public holiday rates and about different things. And, uh, sustainability of wages and that kind of stuff. And they had self-reported themselves to the to the tax department regarding those wages. And then it got deeper. And that's where it got that's where it got ugly, right? And he was put up as the poster boy for it's a big concern though. His, payment. his company's big though, isn't it? It's not small, is it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Well it was, yeah. sorry. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So yeah, it was. It took over um uh four different four different different kinds of venues. So um so yeah it was a big organization. Um, so yeah, I mean, underpayment and that kind of stuff, like it's been a, it's been a massive thing here. Like there's, there's, um, pretty much always been, you know, cash in hand and that kind of stuff, um, from when I started in the industry, which has been bad and that's largely been, you know, to, uh, foreign workers and, and that kind of stuff. And, um, but then there's the other side, which is like, um, so today's actually a public holiday in, in Victoria. So if you're working in a cafe now and you were just, um, let's say, making coffees or you're running coffees or whatnot, you're probably going to get, because it's a public holiday, you're probably going to get around $40 Australian an hour. So $40 Australian an hour is roughly around £70. Sorry, opposite way. No, no way. 20. Yeah, no. Yeah, £20. Yeah. No, yeah, it'd be about £20. Sorry. <laughs> 70 pounds you'd have to close your shop um <laughs> but about 20 pound right which is which is a lot i'd imagine but 20, it sounds pounds, a lot when i hear you say that yeah yeah, yeah 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 so i mean when you times that by five or six staff that you might have on like that's a lot of money and and that wasn't sustainable so it got to the point where there was um i would think anecdotally under underpayment across the board mainly of foreign workers and this other side, which people were getting very good remuneration if they were um, paid correctly, which was killing the businesses that were doing the right thing. And then on top of that, you've got a thing called superannuation here in which um, for retirement, employers have to pay, if you earn over a certain amount per month, they have to pay 9.5% of your salary on top, okay. right? Um every single uh every single quarter right so i have to pay that as well um you know and then obviously things like work cover and that kind of stuff to make sure that if people have accidents or work they're covered so i mean it's expensive it's expensive to hire people and and um in a restaurant uh doing the right thing like it would be very normal to see wages at sort of somewhere between 37 to 45 percent oh Wow, I think for restaurants over here, well, it depends. It depends what type of restaurant, but I think for the most sure. part, fish and chip restaurants will probably be about twenty, twenty-five percent. Uh, you know, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I think if it's takeaway, I think I've heard of some people saying ten percent, but I've heard I think maybe the average is fourteen. Like you know, for for takeaway only, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. but, you know, okay, that makes sense for takeaway yeah, only. Takeaway only, yeah. Yeah. But, like that. yeah. Yeah, like. That sounds like a lot, man. 30, 40 percent. Like, yeah, like so you could yeah, you know, because rent increased as well, right? So yeah, you know, rent I, mean, like, I wouldn't touch a rent that was anything below, sorry, anything above ten percent of what I my predicted revenue would be if I was opening from scratch. But you know, it's it's creeped up to fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. So 
pre-COVID, like, would you have had, um, like, shortages, skill shortages, staff shortages? Because that's something the hospitality industry has been having over here. Yes. Okay. So then that drives mm. the price up even more, essentially, um, to some degree. If you want skilled yeah, people. Yeah, to some, like, to some degree. Well, you have this sort of perfect storm, right? So you've got, you've got an undersupply, you've got, a, you've got a short supply of workers. You've got too much competition in the market, too many venues which usually leads to moving like food prices, not moving very much. Um, which means that something's got to give, right? Yeah. So, and usually it's the employees Yeah. and that's where, the, that's where the underpayment has sort of happened or, you know, supply term with suppliers dragging out and people not getting paid. Like there's a heap, there's a heap of suppliers who are, who are listening to both to our podcast right now still who haven't been paid from businesses pre-COVID, yeah, that opened pre-COVID. Before that, yeah, you no, know, before that, like that's that's um, yes, man. We 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 had a. Good thing. I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember. I'm not got it in front of me, but mm. there's a there's a really good chef in the UK. Um, mm-hmm. his name's Sat Baines, and and he mm-hmm. said like he's only up the road in Nottingham, so it's only like forty minute drive, and he said mm. there isn't a skill shortage or a staff shortage. There's just too many bloody restaurants. And it made me think, like, and it's that oversupply of restaurants. Like, I mean, years ago, like, I'm probably showing our age a little bit. It was like it was a mm. treat to go to a restaurant, whereas now, yeah, and I think yeah, that's what, and that's what shifted with COVID. It was like everyone was going to restaurants, and then all of a sudden, everything just turned to like, oh no, we're eating at home. And like, and I think mm. I said to you in our original conversation, like, we did have shortages a little bit for about two weeks, but it was just two weeks to move everything from hospitality and wholesale. Mm to mm-hmm. retail retail yeah and it just took a couple of weeks just to get everything geared up and off it went and it was fine again there was mm-hmm. no shortages but you know when mm-hmm. i say shortages that no one went hungry like don't get me wrong like yeah you know, yeah you know, we don't mm-hmm. live in a third world country luckily we live in the uk and australia so you know um some of the things i've heard from other countries especially like you know i had a had a good chat with um with Haley from south africa and that was a month or two ago and that was in or oh, where are we <laughs> Forget the month we're in. October, <laughs> I, think were, October. I think that was in August. Um, I think that was in August, and she told me that you know they were supposed to get um, employees were supposed to get government money, much like the furloughed scheme in the UK and what we call JobKeeper here, and they'd had one payment, one payment since March, and there was a massive corruption issue, and the government had um, stopped supply of booze. And cigarettes. Okay, now talk about tension. <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> no, can you imagine <laughs> UK and the U and, and Australia did not have alcohol, did not have cigarettes. Can you imagine the amount of people that would be on the streets? More mm. so, like it would just be, it would just be. Intense. Sometimes I say to my friends that I feel that sometimes, as British people, we can be quite yes. ungrateful. We live in a first world oh, country. Totally. You know, if the totally. Wi-Fi goes totally. off, we've got to blame someone. You know what I mean? Like, and yes. yes, when when people were sent home on furlough, they were getting eighty percent, and many yeah. employers topped it up to a hundred. So they were getting, wow. you know, and and. You know, you see sometimes like out the, the opposition government are always saying, "Oh, well, you should, the government should have made it a hundred percent." But wow, I'm not being funny. Like compared to other Why? countries, like like if you and if you look at in America, um, and I think you'd know this anyway. But I think the initial mm. pot for hospitality ran out in like a week. Yes, the money yep. in the UK, we're going to pay for it. There's no doubt. We are going to get like mm. absolutely like you know caught out on this, right? But mm. no one, like every scheme the government's done, the money was there. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you know. yes, did you know all about it initially? No, it took a few days to sort of get the, the conversation going. Yeah. But like yes. when they did the furlough, they built new software for it. They, they didn't have software for this COVID furlough, did they? Yeah. So they built the <laughs> software and it was processing over 100,000 transactions a minute. Yeah. Oh my lord! Yeah, and everyone was like, "Oh, I had to wait. Oh, it was late coming." You're like, you know, you know. Thank and, God, there's no one supporting you. Like, and, and, and don't get and don't get me wrong. I am sure that there was, you know, people that got caught out and and they fell sure. through the gaps. And and I know that, sure. but I feel that the majority got really looked after. And and mm. then I think that the minority that didn't get looked after initially got sorted out mm. a bit further down the line. 
but, Absolutely. You know, but I just think that it's so quick to blame the government for everything. And I get that. Mm. It, it's a political thing. You feel like you, whichever side you lie on, you want to defend, yeah. you know, that side. But I mm. just think that, I don't know, in, in some ways, I just think that, you know, we're a first world country. For the most part, we've done okay. Um, yeah. So let's count our blessings. We're healthy oh. You know, 100%. and I know people that have died from COVID and yes, they were older mm. and yes, they had preconditions. And I know that falls into a certain narrative politically, but yeah. uh, you know, it is real. Like, and many would tell you it is, like, but I think rational people have started to become conspiracy theorists. It's been going on for so long. Like, yeah, they think something's behind it. right? Yeah. Like, and yeah. you know, and uh, time will tell but i think hospitality in our i don't know how it's been over there but i think for the most part mm. over here takeaways have done okay pubs mm -hmm. have struggled but are now doing okay um mm -hmm. restaurants are still really struggling um mm -hmm. because we've got this great policy over here called the curfew and yes <laughs> it is not... Was it 10 p.m right 10, is it 10 p.m 10 p.m right and look and i think for the most part restaurants are just saying look let us have till 11 like just mm, let us have mm -hmm. till 11 we're doing social distancing our staff are wearing masks like if you can just let us have till 11 because you can do a proper second sitting if you you know yeah you know. yeah good point so that's really good and point. that's their point they're saying look you know mm. we've got to throw people out at 10 o'clock and then everyone ends up mm. queuing up to get on the tube together so what's the point anyway so or you could say maybe we can stagger people like you know so someone leaves yes. at 10 and 10 15 and 10 30 and so yeah. on but for yeah. the most part takeaways which are the majority of my business and pubs which are the second part of my business are doing all yeah. right you know that the yeah. orders are trickling through um but uh, why do you think pubs are doing okay that's booze, interesting to me booze isn't it it's booze whatever you say yeah. and the art it's it's more casual say again do you think it's because it's more casual probably yeah probably but i think i think people some people have actually enjoyed cooking at home like yeah, I can agree. see that too. Like, you know, like for mm. years, I think everyone's believed that they can't do it, that they can't cook, yes. you know. And actually, yeah. when you had to do it, they did well. Like, mm. and I wonder if that's opened their eyes a little bit and their appetite a little bit and thinking, well, I can do this. Like, there's certain food that we would, in my house, would never eat at. Like, they would just never do because I say, I can do that better. So, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I wonder if everyone feels a bit like that now. Like, you know, I can do that. Like, you that's know. Amazing. Yeah, or why would I pay that? When I know I can do it at home for nearly as good for a lot less or a lot, lot less, less for a lot, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and, you know, and if you are celiac, well, you don't have to worry about it no more. You can cook at home. And if you are vegetarian, <laughs> you cook at home and, you know, yeah. but so yeah. what's it like there at the moment, because obviously you've, your, your cases are rising again. Yeah. We, apparently like, yeah, you, UK, apparently yeah. we had 240 deaths a day or something a day, a day. So, <laughs> give or take. so it's shooting yeah. up again, but I think, we don't really have a well look, we didn't have a great summer it wasn't blazingly hot for a long time so mm. you know it was a short window of heat let's say and and i think but it's different because we're now going we, the the uk government are now saying that they're not going to have a full lockdown they've almost explicitly said no it's not going to happen but they are willing to have regional lockdown so manchester just got locked down i think when i say lockdown it's so what does that what does that mean does yeah, that mean things is, does that mean the again, possibly? The curfews and restaurants have to close i think and pubs have to close and then that's it but then they'll just do deliveries and takeaways i guess I guess right, okay. maybe that's the wrong yeah, interpretation. Yeah, yeah. I haven't really followed it that much, but I don't think mm -hmm. it's a full on lockdown, like, you know, stay home mm -hmm. like it was before. Um, but I think that in Scotland, they've got a full on lockdown. And like, I was chatting to one of my customers earlier in Scotland and he says like, he's contemplating taking the Scottish government to court. And one of his friends just took them to court in Glasgow and won the case. And he's, wow. got, he's got an Italian cafe and the yeah. council said that it's not a cafe because a cafe sells bacon and eggs. And it's a bit of a greasy spoon, as we say in the UK. And he's saying it's an Italian cafe. Like, and they're saying, no, but you're not a cafe. You're a restaurant. And he goes, no, I'm not. I'm a cafe. I shut at five o'clock. I'm a cafe. Like, you know. Yeah, of course. It's logical. And he says their interpretation of cafe takes you back to the 1960s. <laughs> you know? yeah. And and, some, yeah. and and a woman in, in Glasgow just won a court case. So so I think that's going to set a precedent, to be fair. Like, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think hospitality, for the most part, are doing well. I think very rarely with a track and trace system do you see it flare up in hospitality. So, mm. you know, I think for the most part, they're doing all right. And so mm. I think 
So regional lockdowns, there's no point closing down Cornwall where they've got very low cases when it, sure. when the cases where I am are quite high. Why would you yeah. do a whole country in that case? Like, you know, yeah. so it doesn't really make sense. Like, but what do I know? I'm just Joe Bloggs. And it's true. I don't mean that like to put myself down. I don't know. Like, I don't know what data they're yes. working off. I don't know. Like, I just, you know, to some degree. Do you, reckon that, do you reckon that's the hard thing during these lockdowns is the fact that there is so much information and it's so hard to decipher not what is true and what's not true, but like what opinion you should even have. Cause there's so many different shades of like what's got, what the hell is going on at the moment, you know? Yeah, there is that. Like I think for the most part, people are just sick of it. They just want to crack on with what yeah. they were doing before. I think and yeah. I get that. And that's why our government, they, they said early on, we don't want to lock people down because you can only lock people down for so long. Like, you know, yes. and they said three weeks. It went on for months, and and I think, and and and, and I can see why because if you said we're locking it down for months, they would have said "f off, mate." You know, we're not going to. Yeah, do it. yeah. So they they almost yeah. they kept us going, like, and you think, and I understand why. I don't hate them for it. I get it because humans are not made to be locked up, but they're just not. Like, you mm. know, <laughs> there was a few funny jokes going around. And that's what kept us all going. To be honest, it was jokes mm. and memes, and uh, one that went around made me laugh, and it says. Now we all know what it's like to be from Liverpool because the going joke is that people in Liverpool <laughs> don't work. And like, and I, and I sent it to my mate who's from Liverpool. Oh, uh, he well, was Liverpool. not happy. I think he was willing to break lockdown, come kick my head in. So, yes. <laughs> so, but, you know, without jokes, and we would have had nothing to do, like, you know. And, yes. But I think the good thing was the weather was moderately okay then. Like, now it's wet, it's drizzly, it's crap. So, sure. So, sure. you know, I think that who are we to judge? Like we just do what we're told and let's just carry on. And I don't mean, and even I'm being funny, we're in a first world country. It's not do as you're told like you're in China. Yeah. It's a very different yeah. thing. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And you see that banging about on Twitter, like, Oh, you know, and, and I've seen the argument that says, you know, people on Twitter that say, so if they support for the most part, I'm, I'm, I'm mixing it up a little bit here, but for the most part, mm -hmm. if they support one part, which is, the, say, the shadow government, which is Labour, mm -hmm. they will be saying mm -hmm. lockdown, 100% furlough. And I'm really paraphrasing yeah. and making it really easy here. I don't want to like sure, do sure. a political thing here. But they'll be saying yes. lockdown nationally, furlough, give loads of money out again, you know. Mm -hmm. and um, And then... The other side is saying, "Open up, open up! Like, what are we doing here? Mm -hmm. It's only the elderly mm -hmm. that die. What are we doing? Like, or mm -hmm. all the you know preconditions, and and yes, and it's almost become that anybody with those views just they they just fight against each other, and you think, yeah, I don't quite like either of those options. I don't want it to be fully open, yeah. and, and I don't want it to be fully yeah. closed. But you know, seeing an argument saying that the government should change the law that changes people's civil liberties." to then lock down and force it, they don't realise mm. that actually governments don't like taking back power. Like, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, once yeah. they've well, established they it. And what, what happens when, it, you know, you've, they've now set a precedent for themselves. Yeah, and, and to be fair, Boris Johnson said this early on. Like, he said, I don't mm. want to take away, like, people's civil liberties. I don't want to clamp mm. down on laws. You have to be responsible for yourself. Mm. And... You know, and I, I think he doesn't get a lot of credit. A lot of people don't like him. And I, and I see why, yeah. because there's the whole Brexit thing that we've got going off over here. Yeah. Like. So, yeah, yeah. you know, but hey, after Brexit, we'll be best mates, you know, if yours isn't the Brits, you know. <laughs> You'll be back to best friends because <laughs> you can't rely on Europe anymore. It's, uh, it's, but to be fair, I, be a, I think for the most different. part, I think for the most part, the way I've always understood it, I don't think Britain ever mm. relied on Europe. I think, and, and I think a lot of people say like, because we're we're an island and that's a continent, we've never quite truly yeah. felt like a part of Europe. Part of Europe, yeah. yeah. And and oh, I guess Australia knows what that feels like, don't they? But you know, like, you know being a huge island all on your own, like absolutely, no one cares about us here. So. <laughs> you know, you know. But I think I think for the most part, I think everyone just gets. You, know, you see it in America, it's very political. It's everything. So yeah, you know. And I think, yeah. but again, because no one's had nothing else to do, like you know, what else? What you know? But I do think our government have done okay. You know, they they did a VAT deferment. They did a staff furlough eight mm. percent grants. You know, the average business got ten grand in their account. They didn't even have to apply for the most yeah. part. Ten grand. Other businesses that paid yeah. higher rates got twenty five grand. 
Like, wow. And and so yeah. and, and and it was their prerogative. Like they didn't have to close; they could stay open as long as they did mm. like, safely take up uh, them um, uh, click sure. and collect or delivery. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I, I, I don't know to some degree, you think, and now we've got. I don't know if you guys have VAT over there. I know we spoke about it in our original podcast, but yeah, we have GST, which is slightly different. Yeah, yeah. And over yeah. here on luxury food and restaurants. So luxury takeaway, no luxury mm-hmm. food, as they call it, which is takeaway food or restaurant, you have to pay twenty percent VAT. So it's a consumer yes. tax. Yeah, uh-huh. people in our industry get really confused about this because they see it as their money, like, but it's not. It's yeah, we're we're the collectors. Yeah, we collect it for the yeah. government. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. they don't give us anything for it, but we collect it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And it's 20%. Well, that, that made it 5%. You know, and I get, I know, I said early on, I, I said early on they were going to do it, and everyone just called me out. I said, no, nope, Stell, you're wrong. That like, government don't drop VAT. And I mm-hmm. sort of read up on what happened in 2008, and I saw that, that everything was aligning the same way. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't think mm-hmm. they'd go as low as they did, to be fair. I was shocked. Like when they went from like I have seen them go down two and a half percent, but to go fifteen percent was huge. And and they've yeah. said that was till January. They've now extended it to March. They right, get, right, I'm yeah. telling you now, I feel like they're going to extend it again. Like, you mm-hmm. know, have you guys seen any reductions like that on t- VAT or tax or anything like that? Yeah, not on tax. So not not on not on like the version of VAT that, that we uh, that we have here in the GST. That's um uh, that's slightly different. Um, but yeah, we've had the same grant scheme. We've had a thing called JobKeeper, which is like uh, your furloughed scheme, except it's not it's not an 80% thing. It's a standard rate per week. And, um, a bit, they have a to bit be more like America. Then. Yeah. Pardon? A bit more like America. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah a bit lot more like America. Um, and then, yeah, there's been grants for, especially for CBD and and that kind of stuff. Um, we're now about to move into hopefully outdoor dining the next week or so. And um, so it's been, you know, sort of five grand or 10 grand for that. CBD that for up. those over here that don't know, Central Business District, isn't it? Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yep. No, no, because yeah. I had to so look it up earlier. I looked yes. it up earlier. After you mentioned it in our last podcast, I thought it was on about. Oh, you don't know that. No, what do you, what I, do you got? I thought it was on about CBD oil. <laughs> No, I don't think we had. I was very happy I guess, last time we had. I guess if it's central business district, I guess we would probably just yeah. call that a city center. I don't know, like. Yeah, I think you call it a city center. Yeah. So basically, the it's basically the CBD is like would be the main part of London. Yeah. Right. Um. And um. And yeah, until you get to the you know the next suburb. Yeah. That would be the okay. the city center. Yeah. So yeah. so because that's been decimated, you know, obviously worldwide, but. Um, you know, Melbourne, we've had since March, we've had one month um, that restaurants and pubs and cafes have actually been open for indoor service um, for dining um, since um, since March. It's um, It's been obviously a very trying time. So um, now they're trying to move everything outdoor because our seasons are flipped and we're about to move into summer um, and we've gone through winter. So, um, yeah, hopefully the the sun will shine a bit. I want to, so we're going to end this soon because this is probably like the longest podcast yeah. you've ever done, man. Like, you know, <laughs> and, and, and this is like, it's close to it. This is normal for you, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I always said I wanted to keep them short, man. Right? Like, I don't know. Like, really hard, isn't it? When you have a good conversation. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't like cutting yeah. out good things that people say. Like, and then I'm always cautious that right. you, you change the tone of what someone said if you cut it out. Like, so. Yeah. Good point. You know, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I don't know. Like, in a way, like, in some ways, like, I don't know who do we all look up to in the podcasting world. It's probably someone like Joe Rogan or, Joe Rogan, you know, or yeah. Mark Maron. I love Mark Maron. Like, so I listen to him all mm-hmm. the time and I don't, and I do really try, but then if someone's made a really good point, why would I cut them off? Like, you know, yeah, yeah. Like, it might lead to a 15 minute discussion is the, is the tricky bit. It is, yeah. you know, and as long as they don't get boring yeah. with it and you know, but yes, you know, it is what it is. And uh, I always say, I always say to my 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 listeners, like, if you don't like it, just switch off and go on to the next one. Like, honestly, like, I'm yeah. not going to be offended. I don't know, like, you know, and I listen to a lot of podcasts because I do like fifty thousand miles a year, so driving. So, yes. yeah. If I, you know, if I see a, a Joe Rogan one, which is an MMA one, I just I don't mm-hmm. I don't watch MMA, so I don't want to listen to it. And I, I yeah, I, I thought, but how did you? What made you want to get into podcasting? Like, because I wonder if we've got a similar thing here, but we might not. So. It's a good question. Um, a, a lot of people have said my voice um, 
suits like radio or something like that. That's so not I'm, usually I'm that's not that. usually a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, yeah. your voice your is your face. Your face yeah. your face. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then I just had um, a friend at the time, sort of. I think it was in I started this thing in sort of 2018. Um, say to me, why don't you why don't you do a podcast? Like it seems to be coming up now. Like it was quite easy to tape and record them. Um, you know, over phone calls and that kind of stuff. Um, and so I just did and I just started inter- interviewing my friends and it made sense with the consulting to sort of have a podcast on the side to make sure that um, my c- customers or people in the industry knew that I um, knew what I was talking about and, and was speaking to high quality people. So, I mean, that was that was the real basis from it. And then I just really enjoyed conversations. Like I've always enjoyed, I've always enjoyed recruitment and I've always enjoyed just sitting down and talking to someone for the first time and understanding their story. So I think that's probably where it is. I just like, I like listening yeah. still. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> I like talk. What about you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <we're perfect. laughs> no, I think I think for me, like, so we, we've always been, so Ceres, when we started, we've always been big on blogging. Like, you know, we don't call it a blog anymore, but it's a news feed. And I think, you know, yeah. And then about, about maybe two years ago, I thought, oh, let's try get into YouTube videos, get some content going. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and they're only 12 minute videos. Like they weren't like, you know, it'll be an interview similar to this, but face to face in person. And bought all the gear, you know what they say, all gear, no idea. You know, like <laughs> we, and I did about 10 videos and I then put mm-hmm. out like a survey to all my friends, customers, whatever, whoever watched it really. I said, look, mm-hmm. what's your feedback? Right. And they said, we had two like real striking bits of feedback one too Mm. long yeah 12 minutes right 12 minutes like you know and and 12 minutes yeah okay and you know i can go man like so so, and then the other the other the other comment was not long enough not enough content like so there was Mm. and, and i realized that actually the medium for what we wanted to do, which was an informative thing, just didn't work. Mm. And then me and my friend were always listening to podcasts. Like, I'm, like I said, I'm always in the car. So he's like, Stel, why don't you do a podcast? I was like, yeah, get lost. Like, come on. Like, and he's like, no, no, do a podcast. It makes sense. And I was like, mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, but who's going to want to listen to me or someone else? And like, and he's like, no, no, it's yeah. easy. Like, it will. It's better because. I realized that also the medium of YouTube is someone sitting down on the sofa to watch it or on the computer Correct. quickly. Whereas yeah. with the podcast, as you know, people can take us wherever they want. Like, you know, we're yeah. driving with them or at the gym with them or wherever. Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> one guy said that he listens to me before he goes to bed. I don't know if that's, no, I that's... think it puts him to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so, but like, and I think, so, you know, I, I just said, well, I'm going to get a bit of gear. We'll do 10 episodes. Mm-hmm. If it works, we'll carry on. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, mm-hmm. we hit seven. This is probably 74, give or take, I think. So, like, yeah, right. So, I think Amazing. that, you know, again, I think that having a long form conversation with people where they can actually really think about what they want to say and, and not feel under pressure yeah. and explain yeah. it. And I think I've always allowed people to do that. I, I, don't, I don't think you can't do that on a YouTube video and you can't do it in an article. Like, whereas with a podcast, there's something about it. Like, I don't know, I think you kind of feel like you're in the room, right? Yeah, I think so. Like, yeah, I think so. I think like, I, know, I think that when I listen to really good podcasts, I feel like I'm there. I feel you like not I'm feel like you're giving your opinion training. back as well. Like you're like I feel like you know like you know I, I and I get like countless messages afterwards saying, "Oh, I just listened to that podcast with just such and such, and I thought this was great, and I thought yeah. that was great, and I'm like, oh, great, like, you know, like." And it is good. Mm. I, I love that interaction. Like, and I think I do. Mm. I do think it, in, it motivates people because I think mm. what we all think is, oh, they've got it easy there. Oh, they're lucky there. Uh, and, yes. and when you see that actually, you know, other people like have gone through, you know, the same thing, if not worse. Or you know, one one of my friends that I did a podcast with had really bad epilepsy, and I remember someone ringing me and saying, oh, mm. I was like, I was. It was profound. I wanted to cry. Like. And, and you know when mm. it was, and I was like you know it feels like you're doing something quite good in a way like you know yeah and I'm not in the business of just making batter like I, I always say this like yes I've got food products that we develop we've got solutions that we develop but we're here to almost mm. educate and inform too like yeah and you're helping the industry 
exactly. I don't see myself as I don't know. I don't. I don't see myself as helping the industry. Which again, I I denigrate myself. I put myself down. But I do think that mm. others, that at least I'm bringing to the table, like people that listen to you, will learn something mm. today. Like when they listen, you're to creating the conversation, right? I guess. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I, you know what I mean? Like, that, like, like I feel the same way, and and that's the reason why you know it's hard for me to do these sort of <laughs> hard in a way. It's, it's very fun, but it is hard for me to do these co-hosted podcast because i'm not usually talking so much yeah you know what i mean um but it's i've it's, i've tried to shift it a little bit fun. i've tried to shift it mm. a little bit recently and and again like it might be worth it for you to look at but i i'm you know i've got interviews that i do and i've got conversations that mm -hmm. i have and they're completely mm. different things so if i'm interviewing somebody <laughs> and we've done lots mm -hmm. of them i'm very so mm. giving them lots of space lots of time like, like you know sure. i'll ask a question maybe say something myself but mostly the focus is yeah. on that person is on that person yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. just similar to your podcast that i listen to as well however mm. a lot of people say to me still why don't you give your opinion why aren't you saying something yeah. you know and i'm like oh no one yeah. no one cares about me like and i'm i don't mean that in a needy mm. way i mean like but no you're not here to listen to me i'm just bringing you the other person but then yeah. recently we have started having some more conversations with people in the industry, my my own close knit industry, where we are a bit more like this and it's a bit more comfortable yes. and it does feel like a round yeah. table conversation. And the people listening, yes. rather than just listening, they feel like they're taking part, like, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. and totally so I, I do think we can mix this up a little bit. I do, mm. you know, but. Yeah, it, it, I'm becoming better at it. I oh, think. mate, you're great. Honestly, I, I think you're well confident <laughs> on it. Like, you know, and one of the other Thank downsides you. with the video thing is I hated having a camera in my face. Like you, like listening to you, yes. it's like you're really comfortable doing this. And I feel like I'm not very comfortable. Like, but again, that mm. could be just me being me. And you're probably just as hard on yourself, I guess. Who knows? Like, oh, super critical. Yeah. yeah, like like especially if I think something's going to go really well or and it doesn't or a question doesn't land the right way yeah. or... Like you never know because sometimes you speak like I'm not sure with your guests, but sometimes I'm speaking to them for like for the, the first proper time. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I've heard about them and I really want to connect with them, and a podcast is a really good way to have a chat, and and then it just doesn't flow, or, yeah, or whatever. But um, you try and you try and save it. You got to, well, you got to try, and and you know I, I always yeah. take responsibility for that. I will you know I'll, I'll never blame it on the guest. Oh. I'll always take responsibility for that. Yeah. The one thing I yeah. I've always really struggled with, always is doing the intros. Like, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> right. I'm starting to get better at it, but it's <laughs> I'm not great. <laughs> like just talking to yourself, like now we're chatting, we're having a yeah. I can see you, you can see me. But then when you yeah. do an intro, it's just like, um, all right. Yeah. <clears throat> and, you're and sometimes if you're reading, I don't know if you read off. I try, you read yeah, I try yeah, I try and uh -huh. shorten it now and, and, and yeah. because, well, I, well, so I try to shorten it, but I've tried to shorten the paragraph so I don't sound like I'm reading from a book, like, you know, uh -huh. but my, my intros now have become probably four or five minutes because again, we're trying to give people a little update of what's going on. Like, you know, yeah. you know, what article yeah. did we yeah. just bring out? What product have we just brought out? And, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, well, I had people saying to me, a really good customer of mine who's got quite a few sites. He says, Stella, I listen to your podcast. He goes, but if I didn't know what Sarah's was, I wouldn't know what Sarah's was. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, well, it's the Sarah's podcast. You've not told us about who you are. You've not told us about what you do. And it, I thought that I was trying to be like, before that, That's a good point. I was trying to be a mm. bit not overselly, you know, like, but yeah, 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 same. I'd, yeah. yeah. He goes, I'm not being funny, Stella. He goes, it is your podcast. Like, why wouldn't you do that? Like, <laughs> And I thought about it and he was right. Like he was so right. And I think yeah. sometimes I can be too polite for my own good. Like, you know, mm. and I think now the more I just let myself come out a bit, like, yeah, you know, I think you just got to, you know. But I've got the same issue, right? I never talk about the consulting. I think, again, I listened to yours today. So I listened to your intro today, like two, I listened to yeah. two podcasts today and and I did think your intro was slightly a bit too short, not to be critical. Yeah. I thought, no, 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 no. I thought he's doing what I do. He's just getting on with it. He's just like, yeah. And I was like, and, and I think once, you, you, you know, it, I felt good that we were in the same space there because I was like, he's just yeah. doing what I do. Like, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. And, and it is, you know, it is difficult because I think we're pushing ourselves to do something we don't usually do. Like, true, you know. Yeah, but, I totally agree. But mate, you know, I I'd love to do this again, and and I think you know 
yeah, I don't know. I just think there's a lot of things that we could, although we spoke longer than last time, we probably didn't talk about a lot of things, but I think that there's a yes. lot that we could talk about. Like I think on a regular yeah, basis, agree. like, you know, I think we could a, a regular chat. I reckon we could have a monthly show. <laughs> Sarah's meets. <laughs> Sarah's me. You're still in- <laughs> oh God, <laughs> mate. Honestly, I'm not sure my listeners want to hear more of me. To be honest, like, <laughs> I'm not sure if that. I'm curious how many people dropped off after the first three minutes when they heard an Australian on. And um, yeah, we love you know. Australians over here. Really? Yeah, but we say Australia properly. You guys don't say Australia properly. You like you. Lo- you lose the L at the end. Yeah, we. Uh, yeah, it's like a, it's like a Y, Australia. <laughs> yeah, and I, I've never quite understood that. Like, as someone who doesn't speak very good English anyway, like, that just confuses me. <laughs> like, casual and laid back, still. That's why. Yeah. Like we like, you know, people will shorten my name, lengthen my name. Like it's it's no one ever calls me Sean. What? How can you so shorten like, Sean? <laughs> that's a good point. Um, no, like they'll say, uh, well, my nickname is Shouse, but. Um, but I get Shawno, Shawno. <laughs> yeah, you know? see, that just makes me laugh because that's like a Foster's advert over here. So, yeah. <laughs> but like, no, you need a. By the way, no one in Australia drinks. Foster's, I know, I get so that too. More... No, I got told that too as well. It. Yeah, apparently yeah, it's not. A, yeah, but um, no. like, I don't know. You, you need a proper name that needs shortening. I could shorten my name three times, mate, and it's still long. Like. It's... <laughs> I'm quite used to calling you still now. Does everyone call you? Yeah, still? for the most part. Yeah, like it's like yeah. no one calls me by my real name. Yeah, it's just no mm. point. And then there's Stelios mm. and there's Stel. Like, and then some yeah. family call me Steve because, like, my granddad when he came over from Cyprus didn't want to say. Mm. Well, I mean, when he came over in the fifties, Cyprus was essentially at war with the UK. So, oh you, right, yeah, you don't really want. Wasn't a good thing. Yeah, you don't really want to say your name Stelios, I suppose, back then. Yeah. Um, yes. And then. So a few people call me Steve, and mostly to make fun. Um, and, then, and then I think that's about it, really. A Japanese guy called me Stereos once. Yeah, that was hilarious. Right? But yeah, that was nice of him. Like, and then a few people made fun of me for ages out of that. Like, but yeah, for the most part, like he's yeah, he's like you, you know, my all my three names are really long, so it's like it's from Stel. Like, you know, when I first moved to this area, it's really white area, so I moved to this area, and like mm. the neighbor says to me, "Oh, like nice to meet you, I'm John." I was like, "I'm Steve." <laughs> 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 I was just yeah, me, yeah uh, I just I because you yeah. you could say Stelios or like no I what? think he's just like John's like he's like eighty years old yeah like why oh, why bring this okay. difficulty in his life do you know what I mean like yeah why you know why do I need to explain to him like you know my you know I was born over it it's just like, you know what just, it's just yeah you don't want to go into a long no story. and then there's yeah. Dave across the road and he says to me <laughs> it makes me laugh because he's like ninety years old. And he says, you'll always be a foreigner in Atherston. That's where I'm from, Atherston. And I says, why is that then? Like, and and I, initially you think, where's he going with this? Like, yeah. And he goes, yeah. I moved to Atherston when I was 21. Yeah. He goes, oh. he's 90 something now. Yeah. Jesus, and people man. still say that he's not local. <laughs> <laughs> So, and it's not that, he, you know, he's white. He, I think he was born in Belfast and then he moved over uh-huh. here to Birmingham when he was 17, got married. And now he lives, well, when he was 21, he moved here. So we're talking, right. when he moved to this area, there was no houses where I live now. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. yet people still say to him, Dave, you're not from around here, mate. And you think, <laughs> right. Does he have an accent though? No, he's like he has an Atherston accent, like you know, like you know, like he, you know. Honestly, like I didn't even know he wasn't from around here until he told me that story. Like, so it is, oh, wow. it is Atherston where I'm from. It's a bit of a weird place. So, like, you know, but it's weird in terms of it's very old English. Like, you know, it's very, you know, mm. I don't mm. think it's racist, but I think it's just that that Jeez, they just it? see everyone as. They're really friendly. To be fair, you walk down the street, it's like, all right, mate, youth. That's the word around here, youth. What do you mean? Youth, you know, like what, how would you? Yeah, but how would you use that? No, name? that's it. They just what nod and say youth. youth. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is it. That is all they do. When I was in the UK, when I was in the UK, like I was told to say, like instead, because we would say, like, how are you? <laughs> like how? Like, or we go, how are you? Yeah, you know. And um, and you guys say, um, are you right? Yeah, you're right. right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And then I'm going, yeah, you. 
that true? That is true. That is true. That is a thing. Yeah. Is that what you say? Oh, no, I don't know. Like, oh, Someone says, right? are you right still? And you'll go, yeah, you. I think I'd you use it that? as like a, a response. So like if you said hello, so you're right. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know, like, yeah, oh, right. it depends. Yeah. I, think, <laughs> I don't know. But it's true. It makes me laugh because that is something I've heard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we will never say that again. Like we, I don't, and, it, and it's funny when people ask like from other countries what, what I say when I greet someone. And I can never think of it because it's just, there you go. Hey, hey, how you doing? Well, I always, probably say that. I always find it difficult greeting someone who I don't know who it is. So, like, I get a lot of phone calls on my phone, and like, and once uh-huh. a guy rings me who I knew, but I didn't have his number on my phone. So it was like, uh huh. And I didn't ask initially, who is this? Who was? Yeah, yeah. So then I'm spending the next four or five minutes asking certain questions, but still not letting on that I don't know who he is. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, how's it going? How's the family? Hoping that he says. Oh, my daughter, or yeah. my son, or my wife. Like, that would give me a hint. You know, you know. Yeah, and instead, I was yeah. just too polite. So instead of saying, well, I know we've been speaking for five minutes, but who are you? <laughs> who are you? Bro? Yeah. <laughs> and, and then I think we had a whole conversation. I didn't know who yes. it was. And just by chance, wow. and just by chance, when I got home, he'd Facebook message me and goes, oh, great to talk early. I was like, result. Like, but I, I, I did not know. Like, I did not know. And, and that happened to me about a week ago. Um, a friend of a friend rings me and he put on like a voice. And, and I knew straight mm. away there was something fishy. And, like, and I was like, mm. who's this? And, and he'd say something. And I'd then ask a targeted question. I was like, because I really want to know who this yeah. is now. And again, I'm trying to be polite, you know. Yeah. And, and he just burst out laughing. He goes, oh, it's me, Perry. And I was like, Perry, I knew it was something, mate. But like, I just didn't know it was you. Like, then he goes, oh, I was going to see how long I could go for, but because I, I just had a really weird feeling that he was about to tell me to F off. And I was like, yeah, you're right. Like, <laughs> yeah. So I think I'm too polite sometimes. Like, And I always try and yeah. save people's numbers just in case because a lot of people mm. call. You know, It's always like, you know, mm. not at this time of night, gladly, though. Usually when I'm doing a podcast, I get three phone calls. And because I've got favorites set up yeah. and they get through. Oh, yeah. okay. So, yeah, I get that sometimes too. Especially, yeah, especially in podcasts, it's super weird. Yeah, people want to talk okay, when they can't. Right. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's like, it's like, uh, a friend of mine, I've got something really urgent to ask you. Go on then. And he's like, I told you this yesterday. <laughs> yeah. So, mate, honestly, I think we should leave it there though, because this is like yeah. record for you. Like, this is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I need a nap. <laughs> yeah, honestly, like, I just fancy picking up the phone after this yeah. and bringing someone right now, like, because I can talk for ages. <laughs> Yeah. So it's been fun though, man. It's been fun. Definitely. Um how can like I'm sure that people in Australia can't buy your product, unfortunately. Um we yeah. have okay. we no, we have like, you know, we can send it to like we don't do retail, so we're wholesale only. Uh-huh. So we yeah. have sent yeah. samples over there and you know, we are glad okay. to do that if like, you know, we usually say that we'll cover the product if someone covers covers the courier, like you know. But you know, yeah. for us we've never really had a targeted approach to Australia. I know some have I, I, you know, it's so big, Australia is. Yes. For then, yes. even this, and the sales of fish and chips are a lot less than the UK. Like, and I guess, mm. and I'm not, you know, people miss it. I get it, but it's so huge and vast that if I sent something to Sydney and that run it somewhere else, it wouldn't cover it anyway. Like, so, yes. But, you yeah. know, if yeah. anybody's listening to this and they're a wholesaler over there mm. and they want to buy loads of batter, then yeah, give me a shout. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> but you know and i promise you it will be better batter mix than anything you can get over there like you know because it's proper yeah. british batter oh. mix. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, but yeah I, like, you know yeah yeah I, I suppose we don't really supply um australia um, and again i think shipping yeah. for australia is what nearer three months two months i think so i think yeah, you know, so yeah, that you stretch- probably yeah, probably two months. Yeah. So yeah. The- it it would need someone to really believe in the product. Exactly, and, and you know, know, our product's got a life yeah. of twelve to fourteen months, give or take. You know, oh, well, so okay, that's really yeah. So, yeah. but you know, if you ever know anybody that wants to upgrade their fish and chip game, give me a shout. That's my goal. All right. So, and <laughs> where can people find you, Sean, as well? Before we get off, because um, obviously not your yeah, interest. <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't. I won't do that in this podcast. Um, uh, so pretty much, if you just um, search for Open Pantry Consulting uh, dot com, really simple. Um, and then, um, yeah, if you're listening to Stell's podcast and just the Open Pantry podcast, and um, then you'll find me and you'll hear some 
hear me talk to some Australian people, but some UK people and some US people. So yeah, I'll, I'll put a, cool. I always do like a little intro and I'll do a little thing for you there. And, yeah. You know. Likewise. So yeah. Likewise. But mate, it's been awesome. This has. Thanks, Tom. It has. Let's um, let's do it again soon. Defo. Yeah.